I'm going to say, on behalf of the Bundist movement, we need to be very careful about the, the rhetorical that it continues to rise. You see, gun violence, as people refer to it, you know, which is basically just violence, because it could be buying gun violence, it could be knife violence, it could be violence with 2 by 4 This is just going to continue to happen. It is going to probably going to continue to get a lot worse. And as this happens, we need to fight tooth and nail against anyone who screams for gun control. Because the gun violence that happens by the most happens through the hands of the police. More innocent people die at the hands of the firearms of the police than anybody else. And to disarm the working class in any segment of society is a disaster. And it needs to be the job of us, the Jewish people, to be the loudest about do not disarm the public. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of Jewish people who are centrist liberals and, and centrist progressives. And of course, the true centrists today that, are, you know, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, when we're talking about the context of the United States of America, the true centrists today would be the progressives and not the liberals because neoliberals shifted from the center to the right, if anything. I remember hearing that the problem with the Democrats was that they went way too much to the left. No, they didn't. In fact, they went completely to the right. And you have this insurrection with people that are Bernie Sanders-like people, I guess, that try to bring it back to the center, and they feel they have to call it socialist when it's not socialist. Just whatever. Um, we will have more to say about Bernie Sanders at a time and where we will be standing with the progressives or standing against them and how that works. But ultimately, I think one of the issues here is that the United States of America is a rotten system. And we need to stop trusting in the old, not even the old, but the new wave. Uh, yeah, because actually it's the new wave we got to bring down. I mean, it's, it's hard to explain what I'm talking about. I'm just going to remind everybody that Ronald Reagan is seen as the ultimate conservative. And people associate conservatives with the right to bear arms and pro-life and all this other stuff. And people are, in fact, brainwashed into some sort of dialectical that's false, a false consciousness. I'll give you an example. You could, whether you believe in the pro-life or the pro-choice point of view, do you understand that pro-life and pro-choice has nothing to do with the right, the left, or the center within? Like... If you are pro-life, that's not left-wing, that's not centrist, and that's not right-wing. If you're pro-choice, that's not left, center, or right. These are not left-right issues. When you talk about pro-life or pro-choice, that's a not a left-right issue. If you are for gun control, by the way, you are taking a right-wing position, though. That just talks about the layer. I'm talking about the layers and layers of confusion that we have here. If you think being for gun control is left wing you're a moron because being for gun control is exclusively a right wing position I mean it can be a centrist position as well but people are like well yeah but the, aren't the republican conservative guy people you know aren't they supposed to be for guns you know a lot of this is rhetoric I think that it doesn't matter whether you're a democrat or republican the agenda is to get rid of guns and so the way the republicans will do this is they'll somehow let insanity happen so that everybody is afraid of gun. Like, how would I explain? I'm like, I, I think Republicans would, for psychological reasons, encourage poison-tipped bullets. If they encourage this, this would make people think guns are bad. Now, are guns bad? I suppose. Well, cars are bad because cars pollute the air. Um, cars are much more bad. I think you know what's bad or good. I mean, these are kind of dubious concepts because. Uh, you're talking about... I'm just going to play this clip, and then I'm going to give my commentary, okay? October 7th, 2018, that's when this clip came out. You the Borderline Bar and Grill was packed for its Wednesday college country music night when the gunman burst in and opened fire. There were people in the middle dancing and just hanging out and having a good time, and you hear that, and you just know something's wrong. It was before 11.30 in the city of Thousand Oaks, about 60 kilometers from Los Angeles. He was wearing almost kind of like a ski mask over his face, um, but only the bottom half. And then he had a black baseball cap on. He was dressed in almost all black. We were shooting everything from the speakers to anything. So all we really saw was um, just smoke and we just saw the shots taking off. So we just tried to get down as fast as we could and get out of there. Police were there within minutes. 
they heard shots being fired and felt there might be additional victims inside. Upon going through the front door, the sheriff's sergeant was struck multiple times with gunfire. The local county sheriff had to announce his friend, Ron Helis, was dead. <clears throat> the sergeant passed away at the hospital uh, about an hour ago. By the time a police SWAT team went inside, the gunman's rampage was over. He was dead. Investigators are now trying to work out why he opened fire on college students enjoying a night out. The group that I was hiding out with, you know, there were strangers holding my hand saying, you're going to be okay. And, you know, that's kind of what I take away from this is that even though there's a lot of bad in this world, there's also a lot of good people there to help. It comes almost two weeks after another mass shooting. 11 people killed at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lord, I ask that you watch over the families of the fallen. The Thousand Oaks community now joining dozens of others who've come face to face with gun violence in the United States. It's a horrific incident. It's part of the horrors that are happening in, in our country and everywhere. And I think it's impossible to put any logic or any sense to the senseless. With the midterm election bringing change on Capitol Hill, gun control will again be on the political agenda. Alexia O'Brien, Al Jazeera. There is much evidence around to suggest that the weather underground was part of COINTELPRO. The police murder more people than the common criminals who murder people. Now on the level of Torah ethics, we of the Bundist movement mourn any loss of life. We in that context mourn the death of any of these police pigs. However, in any geopolitical context, we proclaim only apathy for the bourgeois police force when one of their little piggies is dead in the act of nanny sitting. Bill Ayers, the terrorist, most known member of the Weather Underground, supports gun control. You might want to keep that in mind. Bill Ayers is a terrorist who worked for a confirmed terrorist organization. Remember, to be a terrorist organization, doing one or two acts of terrorism wouldn't make you a terrorist. You'd have to be dedicated to terrorism. And the Weather Underground actually was dedicated to terrorism. And there is some evidence to suggest that they were part of COINTELPRO as a way of destabilizing Fred Hampton's uh, dreams, uh, Bobby Seale's dreams, you know. I mean, y it just makes perfect sense when you think about it. If you actually stop to think about it, the evidence is there. Just put that in your back pocket, why don't you? Bill Ayers, the terrorist, most known member of the Weather Underground, supports gun control. I would like to say that all of this violence will be ending shortly, however, I find that this is highly unlikely. America is a hate culture. Violence is as American as cherry pie, and no gun control laws of any sort will change that. The only solution is education of a socialist type, which must include COINTELPRO awareness. And the Second Amendment is the best line of defense and deterrence against the hostile swine known as the police. These non-kosher stormtroopers do not deserve any honor. Any police pig that saves you does so out of his own humanity, not out of his bourgeois obligations to the state. Now, you gotta love Al Jazeera, I really do, but um, I like Al Jazeera. I like press TV and I like RT. Everybody who knows me knows this. Uh, however, my really favorite one is, is really RT, um, which stands for Russia Today. Um, you are about to watch a film from Russia Today. This clip came out on November 7th, 2018. With last night's election results in question, we're joined now by a very special panel. We have Wilmer Leon, host of Inside the Issues with Wilmer Leon. He's also host of The Critical Hour on Sputnik Radio. Jacqueline Lookman, she's the co-editor of Lookman Nation, and we have Elijah Manley, former Broward County School Board candidate uh, for the Green Party. I want to start with you, Elijah, because it sounded like President Trump, from what we heard in that speech, is declaring last night a victory for the Republicans, pointing out the fact that for midterm elections they performed pretty well. What do you think these results say about how your generation specifically views the Democratic Party at this moment? 
I think our generation views the Democratic Party as a felt political party that's not really representing our interests uh, when it comes to education, when it comes to the economy, labor, and when it comes to the environment. Climate change is one of the biggest issues facing our generation, but we don't see the Democratic Party talking about that. We don't see the Democratic Party running on less ban fracking, less ban offshore oil drilling. And to me, that's really sad. And I want to bring it back into the studio here for a moment, starting with you, Wilmer, on the issue of uh, felon disenfranchisement in Florida. We just heard Trinity there reporting that as a result of last night's vote, 40 percent of black men in the state became eligible uh, to cast their ballot in, in future elections. How do you believe this move will change things politically in the state? Oh, I think the political landscape in Florida just shifted dramatically. Uh, I think the number is around a million. Mm -hmm. uh, it's estimated that about a million people now receive the franchise. And that's, that's tremendous. And what we know, the data shows us, is that those individuals uh, will tend to vote more uh, Democrat than Republican, which is why the Republicans had been fighting this for as long as, mm -hmm. as, long as they have been. Which mirrors a similar fight we saw in Georgia, where, as Trinity mentioned, uh, Democrat Stacey Abrams won't give up yet. She's saying, you know, votes haven't been counted. And this issue of voter disenfranchisement was key in the race there. Talk about that, Jackie. Yeah, I think it's very important to, to note the voter suppression issue and to explain how long it's been going on, because this is not something that is, is, is just new that, that Brian Kemp just decided to do because when he decided to run. Since he has been Secretary of State, he has been actively suppressing the votes of primarily poor and primarily back uh, black Georgians. And not only has Brian Kemp been doing this, but remember back to the Tea Party wave uh, where all of these Tea Party candidates won uh, uh, local and state elections and, and state houses, and they became uh, um, active in, 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 in setting electoral policy. So then you saw all of these uh, voter suppression tactics really take steam. That happened, that started around 2000. Actually, it gained steam under the Tea Party around 2009. And, and as uh, 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 Elijah said, the Democratic Party has ignored the issue of voter suppression to its peril. And that's even though we were still seeing voter suppression taking place yesterday during during absolutely. the vote. Well, what, what did we see around the country? I mean, break some of that down for us. I mean, absolutely. Just in Georgia alone, in the case of Brian Kemp, and I think that's a very, very interesting case, here's a man who is was currently still the Secretary of State in charge of running the elections for the state, running for a governor actively sort of doing both jobs when he really should have stepped down from the one. He had already been sued by, I think it was uh, an organization called Election Justice, for voter suppression in 2016 mm -hmm. and lost. Brian Kemp, as Secretary of State of Georgia, was sued for voter suppression and lost. And then he somehow was able to get the Georgia State Legislature to pass the same exact match voter ID law that he lost in court about that they implemented, mm -hmm. which is why the, the, the margin, of, of, error, the margin of, of, of defeat, I don't even want to call it that because we don't know right. that that's true, it is so small in that election between Abrams and Kemp. And it's why Stacey Abrams refuses to concede, and she's absolutely right not to. Because it's easy to see how these policies would impact the outcome of this very yes. vote. Elijah, you ran uh, to, to win the nomination of, uh, to run as presidential candidate for the Green Party. So you're involved in third party politics here in the United States. How did those parties do last night? And what will you say to people who blame independent voters for, you know, contributing to a muted Democratic victory last night? So, so the first thing I say to them is I believe in competitive elections. That's the whole point of a democracy is that you get to choose the candidate you want to represent your interests. I believe that we should always have competitive elections. More parties mean more democracy. And we've seen 
candidates all across the country, like Kenneth Mejia um, in California, Emmanuel Estrada in California, and Greens all across the country, especially in Arizona and other places, um, really show what I want to call a green wave, a wave of progressive politics that you won't get from the Democratic Party. And I encourage all of our younger people out there to not fall into the two-party trap of this is a spoiler. Um, you can't spoil something that's already rotten. You can't spoil a rotten system. So I think that younger people need to become more involved in, the, in this new era of politics and fight for radical change and not crumbs from neoliberals. Wilmer, what does it say that the Democrats weren't able to win back a substantial uh, you know, majority in, in the House that people were maybe expecting or in the Senate, uh, any sort of uh, victories there? I mean, are people that disappointed with the party that even with all of the media support or, or antagonism we saw against Trump, this party just fell flat? Well, it shows that the Democratic Party really didn't learn the lessons from the, uh, from the loss in 2016. It shows that the Democratic Party is still entrenched in the politics of the, of the old guard, that they aren't listening to millennials, uh, Elijah and, and, uh, and his demographic, because that demographic brings a whole different level of, or a whole different type of issue to the table. Absolutely. They're talking about gun violence. They're talking about jobs. They're talking about health care. They're talking about access to college. They're talking about their futures. Whereas Nancy Pelosi and, and, and that whole crew, they're really more concerned about two things, keeping power and they are beholden in many instances to the same benefactors that are underwriting the, 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 the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. As uh, Du Bois wrote about, two wings on the same bird. So uh, uh, it, 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 the Democratic Party is refusing to listen to its it's prime it to, to it to its base because again they're playing to the same white male voter that the republicans are playing to jackie i've already heard people saying the mistake of the democrats was they went too left in their campaigning across the country what is your answer no. to that no that that's absolutely not true the democrats didn't go left Definitely enough not. they didn't go they didn't go left at all i mean here you have uh, um uh, uh a third party uh, uh, resurgence, which is absolutely needed, a progressive insurgence within the Democratic Party, that I think is also needed, even though they're going to be fought uh, at every step of the, of the way, tooth and nail, by the entrenched establishment right. Democrats. But that fight needs to happen within the party. But you have uh, an entire demographic of younger voters who are now energized, and, and they truly are energized, because social media has done something that previous generations of revolutionaries have tried to do with the one-on-one -on -one political education, mm -hmm. which is desperately needed, but social media makes it instant and global. So you have people who are learning about the military-industrial complex and American imperialism, getting a firm grasp on white supremacy and what that really means, and you have a generation of energized young voters who see that these are issues that need to be changed mm -hmm. in this system, and they want it changed, and they realize the Democratic Party is not listening to them on these issues. And there, are, there are more millennials in their voting age millennials than there are Gen Xers now. Absolutely. Which is why I just want to give the last You're word right to Elijah. <laughs> One more question for you. You know, the Democrats did make an effort to say that they have candidates like Ocasio-Cortez in New York rising and showing this more progressive side of the party. Is that satisfactory to you? No, no, uh, it's, it's a crumb. Um, and the Democratic Party is a graveyard for progressive politics. And we've seen that every election cycle, uh, whether it was Bernie Sanders running in 2016 or 2012 or any election. Um, and so many people would say the Democratic Party, through winning the House majority last night, um, really did something good for working class people. Well, I want to remind people that over nearly 100 people who ran for Congress as Democrats this year ran were military veterans or intelligence um, officials, former intelligence officials. So to me, it seems like that's not a win for working class people. That's a win for the military industrial complex. And to me, that doesn't go far enough to uh, really helping working class people or younger people in this country. So no, I don't think that um, the Democratic Party's victories with progressives in certain seats, one or two seats, is enough. I think that we need radical change, we need uh, more than electoral politics, we need organizing, and we need grassroots movements. I guess the question now will be whether or not the Democrats will learn a lesson from this election if they were unable to in 2016. It seems like 
the three of you are in agreement, they won't. Quantitative but thank you. versus qualitative is <laughs> right. what they need to understand. Thank you so much That's to our not. panel this afternoon. You guys are all wonderful. And we're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back with some international news. How interesting. Didn't I just say that Democrats and uh, liberals, uh, they have not moved further to the left. They've actually moved further to the right. So it's funny how she says that the uh, they have not moved to the left enough. In fact, they haven't moved at all. I would say they have moved more towards the right. You see, the neolibs, or th which are the replacements of the uh, traditional political liberals, uh, they started off a little bit centrist with a lot of compromises to the right and then they further moved right over time until they're completely right. And in some instances the neolibs are more right-wing than the neocons. Now the neocons have always been right-wing but they've been a hard right. The traditional political conservative leaned a little bit more towards the center to an extent but then what happened was that they they went hard right and a little bit more further right as, as time has gone by. Within the Republicans, we're seeing fringe, far fringe right wing, um, a type of neo fascism, which I would like to make clear that neo Nazism, I would not, I will never classify neo Nazism as neo fascist. Neo Nazism is fascist. It's not classically fascist, but it's fascist. There's different modes of fascism. When you talk about classical fascism, there's the corporatists and the national socialists. Uh, the national socialists are a type of fascist that engage in a racialist theory. Uh, corporatism is obsessed with the state, but they're both classically fascist. And the, what constitute fascism is a sort of characteristics of a type of chauvinistic supremacist behavior. And so therefore, there are fascist concepts that are not classically fascist. I would say that um, a lot of people would probably agree that Franco was uh, not a classical fascist, but he was a fascist. And I would also say the Tea Party movement was proto-fascist. All The alt-right movement. That is completely fascist, but it's not classically fascist. The black shirts are classically fascist, and I kind of am a little bit more disturbed by them than I am the alt-right, because as much as I'm disturbed by the different modes of fascism, I think classical fascism tends to be some of the most frightening things you can uh, witness. And that can vary. All of that can vary. A question has been asked recently, does the Bundist movement support the Machika movement? The answer is yes. We do not always agree with the Machika movement. For one thing, we don't agree necessarily with their stance on Castro, but we do not believe we have the right to tell the Machika movement what to believe. We recognize that the Machika movement represents the indigenous Native American populations of North, Central, and South, and that they particularly give an important voice to what will be probably the largest revolution of the indigenous Native Americans, that being the Mexicans, because the Mexicans are the first that have the labels slapped on them Latino and Hispanic when they are not Latino and they are not Hispanic. So for instance, if you're Sephardic Jewish, then you are Latino and you are Hispanic because Latino refers to those who are Italian and Spanish and I would even say uh, French and Romanian. And if you're Hispanic, that means you're Spanish. Mexicans do not fit this category. Um, several different South American countries that are classified as this are not Latino, Hispanic, they are indigenous, native, population. So we don't agree with the Machica movement on certain things. We don't agree with them, for instance, on uh, their nonviolent stance, but it's not our position to tell them how to do things. And largely their historical point of view, we agree with completely for the most part. I mean, there's very little we disagree with on their point of view of history. They are the ones who represent, they truly do represent the indigenous native population. And they are censored even by different progressive and left-wing media, just as we are. But we would like to break through the left-wing media, and we think we can with the help of a, a certain amount of anarchists and Marxists who have already reached out to us. But if we do that, we are going to not hide the fact that we will want to press the Machika movement out there as well, because somebody needs to listen to the indigenous voice. The reason why people are afraid of the indigenous voice is because they want their land back. Guess what? They have a right to their land back. Okay, and the Machika movement has already stated they don't want to get rid of all Europeans. Should there be a Back to Europe movement? Yes. And should there be a national cultural autonomy for certain Europeans in the American continents? Yes. But here's the thing. There's indigenous natives of the, co of the American continents that live in Europe. So we could 
easily have a certain group, a segment of Europeans re living in the uh, American continent and have a good larger segment and go back to Europe. You don't have to force that. There's a lot of Americans, for instance, and Canadians, mostly Americans, because Americans who are self-aware, a lot of us are just ashamed of this place, want to go back to Europe. Th it is possible. Migration has happened for many reasons. There's many campaigns to do it, and not all Europeans have to leave. In fact, a good segment could stay, and th this has been said by the Michigan movement, but they have a right to their territorial claim over their own continent. Mexicans are not immigrants. They are indigenous Aztec people who have a right to come and go as they please on their own continent. And just look at the, you look at the Navajo and the Apache and their and their land. They don't have water rights. Their the agreements that the United States have made, the contracts they've made with these native tribal groups have not been kept. We need to raise awareness on that. And I think one of the problems is, as much as I love Chris Hedges, who is an actual democratic socialist, unlike Bernie Sanders, who is a social democrat. As much as I respect Chris Hedges, the the actual democratic socialist. I think that that's one of his issues, is I don't think he wants to talk about that because he has a rosy, Christian, sort of nonviolent viewpoint, which we don't agree with. Now, do we completely disagree with Chris Hedges? No, we agree with a lot of what Chris Hedges says. There's a lot that Chris Hedges says that we completely agree with. But, you know, the nonviolence argument is, is, is dying. It can't work. It's utopic. So, I mean, all that just should be put out there right now, you know. Generation X, I'm Generation X, it's sad that we are the generation that has not agreed. And there are still a great number of us, and maybe a lot more of us, who are going back to the political field to do something. But I see more faith in the Millennials. I put more stock in them. And, you know, as has been stated here just now on RT America, that social media has opened the doors for people to learn their own histories. And that's why the crackdown on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter... Why, that's why it's so that's why the crackdown is so harsh because people are waking up we hope to further that awakening with the truth we want to prevent further violence but to prevent further violence you need education you need bread and water fruit and things that are good for the you know you need housing you need these things and the environment, just look at the environmental crisis, is getting terrifying right now. You have to put all this into perspective. So, here's what must be understood. We have a very peculiar stance that we will be taking on a lot of what you just heard. But, what must be said is, first and foremost, we must be happy that there's an awakening going on. This awakening, this political awakening, has been actually going on for a while. Uh, Cornel West talked about this, that there was a democratic awakening going on with people. But now it's actually getting larger, and it will continue to get larger. And I think it's because every empire has fallen. The United States has been put on notice largely by its own citizens, and this shall continue to happen. Just like the citizens of the state of Israel have largely put their own government and their own country on notice. Several of them flee back to Europe, and you know nobody talks about this. And those that stay, many of them have dropped the term Israeli and picked up the name Hebrew, which would be beneficial for us all if they did that, because they don't have a right to call themselves Israeli. That's an identity theft problem that they're doing. Calling themselves Hebrew would make more sense because the language of which they speak is what they call Hebrew. I mean, it's not the liturgical Hebrew of the scriptures or the Mishnah, but that's what they call their language. They call it Hebrew, so they should call themselves Hebrews. I think, though, that it's uh, sad, though, that they bring up gun control, and this is one of our problems with the Green Party. Is We like a lot of what the Green Party stands for, but the Green Party we find to be a little misguided. And a lot of this has to do with the newspeak that starts under the time of Ronald Reagan. Never forget that it was Ronald Reagan, with the help of the NRA, that did the Malford Act against the Black Panthers when he was governor of California. Let us never forget that it was Ronald Reagan who referred to Nelson Mandela as a terrorist, and gave glory and praise unto the Taliban forces and, uh, you know, uh, the Mujahideen, which would be later uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, and I might be screwing that up a little bit, but the fact is is that the Mujahideen is what later was known as Al-Qaeda, and this was backed by such people as Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, and e even to some extent Jimmy Carter before him, they supported these 
groups that did not speak for the Afghan and Pakistani people at all. Like that whole area, which a lot of this had to do with poppies, by the way, and, and drug warfare. But it also had to do with trying to force the USSR to have its own Vietnam. You know, this is, again, like everything else, I mean, again and again I bring this up to people. This is largely a matter of public record. You don't have to go too far to find it. Get ready for some COINTELPRO awareness. David Hogg, the celebrity student of Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida, has openly defended the FBI and given praise to the 2003 American imperialist invasion of Iraq. And we are supposed to believe that this guy somehow speaks for the future of children? I am saying this middle class, upper middle class kid is with his fist clenched as if he's some sort of socialist revolutionary. The stuff that has destroyed any credibility for identity politics. Identity politics is not bad at all. It's actually a good thing, regardless of the criticism that it gets from the Marxists and Lenin, uh, the Marxists and the anarchists who criticize it. They criticize it because they see liberals misusing it. We need to take back identity politics because it's essential. The only way to have our place in the left is to have our identity politics. These liberal misusers, which is the purpose of the center, by the way. Well, you know what? David Hogg is not even centrist. He's right-wing, completely right-wing. He defended the FBI, the same FBI that cracked down on the Black Panthers, the same FBI that consistently, you know, harasses and wiretaps and does all the unconstitutional activities. The same FBI who, in their very website, will not change their stance against the Black Panther Party, despite what came out in the church committee, despite what is now publicly known. David Hogg, again, the celebrity student of Stoneman High School in Parkland, Florida, has openly defended the FBI and given praise to the 2003 American imperialist invasion of Iraq. Going to the FBI website is not going to public information. You've got to understand this. The Library of Congress has all this information, yet you might waste your time going to the FBI website or the Federal Reserve website or the CIA website. Yes, just go to these bourgeois propaganda pieces that are going to tell you nothing about the facts when you can just look at what is in the Library of Congress. Just look at the bureaucratic paperwork. That's all you have to do. Now, of course, I've said before that there are, in fact, conspiracy theories that hold more water than others, but most are manufactured, and everybody in the Bundist movement holds that position. So you don't need to go to the conspiracy theorists. So be very careful of people who talk about false flag terror with gun shooters. This is most likely going to happen because hate crimes will increase, not decrease, because America is a violent culture. And if you want to stop that violence, the answer is better education, which you will never get from the Democrat Party. You will not really probably get from the Green Party either. Now, the peer of the Bundist movement, we have more favor to the Green Party. And that's one thing we want to say right now. Emma Gonzalez the other celebrity of the Stoneman uh, of the Stoneman High School in Parkman, Florida, is the daughter of Cuban exiles who owned plantations. Now, typical of most of the Cuban exiles that America has sheltered, they lament the loss of their private enterprises of exploitation. It is known that Emma Gonzalez uh, and her family hate Fidel Castro for liberating the indigenous Cubans from Spanish plantations. Think about that. These are the people who scream gun control the loudest. These are the people who actually do represent gun control. Right-wing, bourgeois, social justice warriors. You know the liberal that was kind of centrist but that is now going to the left? Do you see the entryism going on by such shills as Hogg and Gonzalez? You see what's going on here. Is it not transparent to you, the active COINTELPRO? What you're seeing is violence in America. And Nicholas Cruz was a Trump supporter and a little bit crazy, too. And he was bullied. And you have to put these factors into it. doesn't excuse what he did, but he was a Trump supporter, number one. And number two, he wasn't all there. And number three, he was bullied by such people as Emma Gonzalez, by the way. This is on record. On the matter of uh, 
uh, Azio Cortez. Um, well, I was optimistic, but she continues to be an absolute disappointment. Um, and that gets us into our next thing. Out of all the progressive centrists, the only one that I didn't fully research was Cortez. And I guess it's because... Actually, I'm not sure why. There was a lot going on. 2018 was a large year for me. And for a lot of us here. But anyway, the more I've dug up her history, the more of a disappointment she is. And her, her actions as of late have been a disappointment. I apologize to everybody about the style and format, I hope, I mean, I mean unless you liked it, and if you liked it, I, I'm, I'm happy, but Venezuela um, is a very important country to some of us, particularly me. I mean, it's, it's very important, I would say, to Uri, but I have a history with some political formations that were attached to Venezuela. I visited Venezuela when Chavez was the president. So it's very important to me that the Bolivarian Revolution succeeds. Anyway, <clears throat> the Bundes movement shall be boycotting federal elections. We shall not be participating in any state elections until we have the support of the people. We will be dealing with local elections and community politics. Because even as we further the agenda, our agenda shall never be to change the United States of America. We would like the dismantlement of the United States of America, and we would like it that the majority of the people will rise up to ask for the same thing, to which the Republic will oust itself as a criminal, draconian regime. And this process will not happen overnight, and this process shall be done in a way where it is popular and it does not scare people. There is nothing to scare from the Bundes movement, but there is everything to scare from... You are to be scared of the police state, honestly, because if you're not, you're very foolish. So again, I apologize for how late it was after midnight, which was the worst thing that could happen. It was after midnight when Hands Off Venezuela Part 2 came out. I slept for no more than two hours. Got up, started this. We are going to finish this presentation now with Jason and the Maoist Rebel. This video came out in December 22nd of 2018. We are now getting another lesson in the reason why social democratic reforms do not work. They do not inherently challenge the system, and they don't, in the most important aspect, get the job done. This has to do with Ocasio-Cortez and her new green plan, the plan that is seemingly ripped directly from Jill Stein and the Green Party. Unfortunately, this new plan is one that is not really a new plan at all. Well, the plan claims to want to transform the United States economy in an effort to fight climate change, but that's not going to happen. That would... Uh, ostensibly push the U.S. fossil fuels from to 100% renewable energy in just a little over a decade. Now, Cortez has completely marketed herself as an anti-establishment candidate, aside for running for the Democratic Party and supporting Nancy Pelosi as the speaker, the very antithesis of being anti-establishment. Now, her proposal got the approval of 30 House Democrats and the support of mainstream political pundits such as Van Jones of CNN. 
so that's how counter and anti-establishment is, that the establishment literally supports it. Now, the plan, the main problem with this is that it has no specifics. It's not really saying anything at all. So I guess she can just claim that it'll be whatever when there's no actual specifics or actual plan laid out. And it'll be drafted over the next two years. Now, the plan entirely avoids the original genuinely progressive initiatives and instead uses language that promotes neoliberal business-as-usual policies. Now, this is being written with the help of experts and insiders from business and industry. The select committee shall have the authority to investigate, study, make findings, convene experts and leaders from industry, academia, local communities, labor, finance, technology, and any other industry or group that the select committee deems to be a relevant resource. The plan shall be driven by the federal government in collaboration with the the co-creation and partnership with business, labor, state, and local governments, tribal nations, research institutions, and civil society groups and communities. So big business that will be handpicked by Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party. Now, you see, anybody who is has even a modicum of honesty when it comes to the issue of global warming and pollution in the world knows that big business is the problem. We need to get away from big business in order to be able to solve this whole situation. But, of course, because the Democrats really are nothing more than another bourgeois party, they're completely inviting all of big business to come in and have a say. I would not be surprised in the very least if we ended up seeing the Koch brothers there as well. Okay, so it's big business and the Democrats handpicked by Nancy Pelosi. Include additional members such as basic income programs, universal health care programs, and any others the select committee may deem appropriate to promote economic security, labor market flexibility, and entrepreneurism. Universal health care, and, and you think that's really going to be passed through the government along with uh, a basic income program. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I don't think they're actually going to be put through... But they're saying that they're going to consider it to promote economic security, labor market flexibility, and entrepreneurism. Labor market flexibility. Now, we know what that means. The ability to hire and fire for whatever reason, for what, whatever possible thing could float through a member of the capitalist class's head. In other words, the, the ability to hire and fire as however they please for whatever reason. You even utter the first three letters of the word union and all of a sudden you're gone. Obviously, we know the, great, the, fleer, the freer the flow of capital, the worse it is for workers. And the more flexible the employment situation is, the worse for workers. The ability to hire and fire at will without just cause, without having any kind of restrictions, without having any kind of oversight, etc. In other words, this is just a gift to big business. This is exactly what we would have expected out of the Democratic Party anyway, but it's being given this faux veneer of complete progressivism and anti-establishment because Cortez is at the head of it for now. Actually, Nancy Pelosi is going to be the head of it, and that's as much of a corporate Democrat as you could possibly get, also known as a Democrat. In other words, this entire so-called green plan, which uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most of the green mysteriously disappeared from the entire article, the article being the plan that they're eventually going to write up would just mysteriously disappear, disappear, and then we're left with the same old capitalist, polluting, world-killing, human life-ending BS that we've had for however long. Once again, this tells us, I don't care how much you think you're helping by supporting people like Cortez. Well, it's better than doing nothing. Well, actually, doing nothing is actually is better than doing the thing that is the opposite of what you're supposed to be achieving. I mean, it would be great if you did something positive. I understand that. But don't do the opposite of what it is that you claim to be doing.
Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.